You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. What Were You Thinking is brought to you by Angie'sList.com. Need veterinary care for your pets? How about someone to work on your home, teeth, or car? Take away the guesswork by choosing a provider that your neighbors gave the highest rating. You'll find thousands of reviews on service providers right in your area. What Were You Thinking listeners get a 25% discount too. Join Angie's List and use promo code THINKING, T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G, and get 25% off at Angie'sList.com. You've had a long day at work, and you can't wait to just get home, take off your shoes, plop yourself down in your favorite chair, and relax. Ah. You walk up to your tranquil residential home and your neatly manicured lawn in your quiet suburban neighborhood, put the key in the lock, open the door, and... Yes, the pets have gone wild! What were you thinking? Welcome to the show about everything you always wanted to know about exotic pets. Where to get them, what to feed them, and how to care for them. You'll even find out why some people live with a monkey. Now, here's your host, exotic pet expert and author, Bob Tart. Hey, Bob, what were you thinking? Hello, welcome to another episode of What Were You Thinking? I'm your host, Bob Tart, author of the book's Enslaved by Ducks and Foul Weather. I'm here with my wife, Linda. Hello. We have not done an episode of What Were You Thinking since our winter doldrum show a while ago. And in fact, we have been in the winter doldrums for how long? Five months. Five years, that's right. Five been, years. It <laughs> seems that way. In uh, Michigan, winter pretty much hangs on all through March and even into very early April. If you're lucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's April, what is it today? Maybe the 10th? 9th, 10th, somewhere. Yeah, and we actually have a very warm day. Spring day, an actual spring day. And uh, in between... It's summer-like. I know, it is summer-like. And uh, you might be able to, uh, over the sound of us talking and our pet birds talking, you might hear our pet geese outside because they were making a yeah, racket. Yeah, I, I let them out of the pen thinking they'd be quiet. No such luck. The nope. natives are restless today. Yep, so I just want to fill you in and uh, update you on a couple of things, and then we'll get on with the show. I wanted to let you know where I am with my new book, The Funnel of Happiness. I just got revisions back. There's the geese. I just got revisions back from uh, my publisher, and when I first got the revisions back uh, from my editor at Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill, I was kind of uh, annoyed at first. So what are these revisions? This is a book about uh, our cats. And then I was looking through the material, and I saw that I had our cats barking and fetching sticks and running agility training. I thought, how come I turn them into dogs? So, um, <laughs> so uh, anyway. Oh, you uh, the problem. Yeah, so that was a problem. So uh, we're making changes in that, and I'm hoping the book will be out in early 2012. Book character Bill Holm and I, we uh, tried doing a a podcast last week. We went to Muskegon Wastewater and we went birding. And it was going to be, I had called the show our Not a Non-Bird Birding Show because the last couple uh, podcasts that Bill and I did from Muskegon Wastewater, we never saw any birds. So we were going at a perfect time and I figured that uh, we'd have plenty of birds to report. It would be a great show. And uh, it was a very sunny day. We got to Muskegon Wastewater, and it was socked in with fog. It was just <laughs> terrible. We went a couple miles up the street, clear as a bell. Wasn't it 10.30 in the morning? 10.30 in the morning, socked Weird. in with fog. We did get back to Muskegon Wastewater, and um, finally it was clear. But we just, you know, we saw a few ducks, but we just see, didn't see enough. So uh, instead of doing yet another... Uh, show where we uh, go birding and don't see any birds, uh, I decided that uh, we'll just make that another lost episode. We already have a lost episode from last year, which I uh, might uh, put out, but uh, this other one, we only did about 13 minutes, and uh, so I I don't think we're going to do that. Uh, One more thing, and then we'll get to the new stuff, and that is um, all of my many, many thousands of German listeners, maybe millions, will want to know that... um, All two. Yeah, that in May, which is uh, just a few weeks off, my German book, Das Land Neurotiker, will be coming out. Das Land Neurotiker. And that is the German language translation of Enslaved by Ducks. And the German title is The Rural Neurotic. (laughs) 
So anyway, you, you go to Amazon.de and uh, you'll be... It loses something in translation. I like it. I like it because I want to write a book about birding. And now I'm thinking of calling the book The Neurotic Birder. <laughs> I kind of like that. So, Okay, so Linda's got some topics and um, I'll let her start you off. You want to talk about the Barrel's Golden Knife first? Go ahead. Or? Go ahead. Well, that was, uh, Bob saw that on the internet, that the Barrow's Golden Eye, which is a very rare bird, was in Grand Rapids. I think they made a special visit just to please uh, Bob and several other people. Yeah, that was about um, was three a, weeks ago. Three weeks ago or something like that. On a Saturday, we hadn't had any little outings in a long time, and we were feeling very housebound and winterbound. So this was gonna, we were going to get up first thing in the morning, not even do our morning chores. Well, maybe you did some morning chores. Anyway, we were just going to zip right to Grand Rapids before we hardly did anything. So we did. We, we got the bare minimum of stuff done, and we went into Grand Rapids, and it was right in the middle of town at this easy-to-park place where we saw some bird watchers there, and we actually did see from a distance the Barrow's Golden Eye right off the bat. Unfortunately, it was not close enough for us to feel like that was a good sighting of it. So we saw it was going down the river. So we thought we would cut through a bunch of side streets and catch it further down by this next bridge. So we were zigzagging around trying to find a place to park to see it further down. I don't think we ever did see a good sighting of it that day. No. But we did go to what they call Riverside Park and see some other ducks, including um, American Hooded Boy. Merganser, and this duck that was right up on the shore that's supposed to be a shy duck called American Black Duck, which, by the way, is not shy. It was just practically reach your arm out and touch it. I don't know why it was so oblivious to us, but they're not black. They're kind of look like... Uh, what do you say they look like? A female ma- um, mallard, kind of. Right, but with the black in the face. A little more almost. gray, a little more gray on their body, grayish black. Yeah, and a dark, real dark not, face definitely with, not a, black. with a light, light patch yeah. on it. Um, I was reading in some of the bird books that um, there's been so much um, interbreeding between mallards and American black ducks that they don't know even know how many pure American black ducks there are anymore. Maybe so that might be why is. the thing Maybe was Maybe they used tame. to be black many, many decades or centuries ago. I should say a little bit about the Barrow's Golden Eye. And the Barrow's Golden Eye is an Alaskan duck. It, it is um, way up in Alaska and in British Columbia. It's a sea duck. And it'll be on inland lakes too up there. But um, that's way, way far off from Michigan. And as far as we know... This is the very first sighting in Grand Rapids of a Barrow's Golden Eye. And there have been a few, as far as we know, as far as since people have been keeping track, and there's been a few sightings of a Barrow's Golden Eye in Michigan. Um, I think there was one in 1962, and I think up in the the Upper Peninsula once in a great while, you're able to see them. But they they look kind of like a duck called a common golden eye, but there there are differences. What was the difference? I can't remember. The uh, patch, the white patch on the face is kind of a um, teardrop or crescent oh, shape, oh, yeah, but yeah, also yeah. there's more black on the back and the um, side up, okay. up by the wings, so it's, or on, it's, it's actually on the wings, the black you on Well, Bob went back the very next day because he wanted to get a better look, and he actually did get a good look at it. Yeah, and, real good look. And what was the other thing you saw? Oh, I went to, also at Riverside Park in Grand Rapids. There was another ocean duck called a long-tailed duck. And you saw that? I saw the female. And those aren't anywhere near as rare as the uh, Barrow's Golden Eye because every winter you can see some long-tailed ducks on the Great Lakes. But we're inland from the Great Lakes, so I don't think they come to uh, Riverside Park very often. Tell them about the man uptown who's the birder who, with no effort whatsoever got to see those close up, close range, the same bridge that we were hoping futilely, futilely to see that yeah. duck. Yeah, I yeah, no trouble at all. He just drove right up there. There it was. Yeah, this guy. Both gra- of them. And the, the long-tailed duck, too. Yeah, this guy in our uh, little town here in Lowell, I called him about the Barrow's Golden Eye, and he just drove up, got out of his car. There it was. Close uh, range. Yep, the Golden Eye and also the long-tailed duck got back in his car and drove home. It was so just it was a lot karma, because he was a lifelong bird wife. He spent his hours and months and weeks looking for stuff, so yeah, that was he, karma. Yeah, and he told us about a long-eared owl a couple of years ago, which was a really wonderful sighting. Beautiful. You see the long-eared owl right on the street. Right, right on his street. Just look up. There it was, 20 feet up in the tree. Yep. So, uh, so that was nice. 
So we had our little outing, and we felt like we were in. We did, there was a paved a boardwalk there. People were walking their dogs. It was beginning to feel a little bit like spring. And we I went, thought it was a very nice experience. Yeah, and we felt went good back, to be out of the house. We went back a couple weeks later to Riverside Park, and we'd never really been birding there before. No, it's and a nice place to go. Yeah, it's not you too. You can walk. You're right by the river. You can walk right along the river all the way. You know, most of the way. It's not too far from uh, where I grew up, and. What was funny was when we went there again a couple weeks later, I saw this uh, woman taking photographs of some duck. And I walked up to her, and it turned out it was our friend Darlene from Ann Arbor. And, you know, Ann Arbor is, what, about two, two and a half hours from Grand Rapids, and she just happened to be here in Grand Rapids looking for ducks. Well, her first what happened was her the guy that she came with, we had passed him. At, that was near the shoreline. He said, oh, if you want to see such and such kind of duck, Go over there by that lady. They might be there, but don't tell her that you said because maybe she wouldn't. She's trying to take pictures, and you might disturb her. Right, right. And so is our friend Darlene. And she turned her head, and that was Darlene. Yeah, it was great to see her. But um, she had uh, had found a couple, three American widgeons, which is a really attractive duck. Oh, so she was taking lots yeah, of pictures. Yeah, and so I got and some good I've pictures got some of that too. Some good too. pictures, and that was right up on the shore. There was like yeah, three of them. Yeah, it? yeah, very Beautiful. tame. And we found Beautiful out. Little duck. They're not too common in Michigan. You just see them during migration. But people have told us that they're kind of park ducks out west, and uh, they're as tame as mallards, and, you know, people feed them bread. So maybe these were a couple of the bread-eating ducks, and if we would have had bread, they might have uh, have walked right up and sat on our shoe. Yeah, they are kind of shorter than a mallard. Yeah, little little kind of bathtub ducks. They're cute, yeah. Okay. So what else did you want to talk about? We mentioned briefly the, our last podcast about these books that I had been reading by Dr. Bradford Brown, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, a Maine vet, and I read both of the books. What and are, where are I'm the so titles impressed of the by them. The, ti- the title of the one is "While You're Here, Doc," and then the other one was called "Just Something, One More Thing." Just Doc. one more thing, Doc. And so they're both about the same title. It's Doctor Bradford Brown, and he was a veterinarian in Maine. in Maine. And these books were written about his experiences, and was it in the fifties and sixties or Probably, something like that? Probably uh, could have been then, or yeah, right around then, sixties or maybe so. earlier. Yeah, fifties and fifties and sixties. So they're great so books. They're wonderful books. I was just very uh, much in the thrall of having just read them. I wanted to call him and tell him how much. I love those books. So Bob got an, on internet for me, found a phone number of the town where he lived, and I called the number, and it was not, it was disconnected. But I don't give up that easy, so I looked in the acknowledgments of names there, and I thought they were names of people that lived in that town, so he looked those names up on internet for me. So I called some of those names, and I was able to talk to the man, well, the man that answered was the father of the guy who edited one of the books. Didn't you talk to the daughter first? The First, I talked to a friend. It was a lady um, where he stayed there at her house for a while. And the second one I talked to was the father of the ed- guy that was editor. He loved this guy. The son lived with him. Right. So that was that. So I got to talk to both of them, the a very elderly lady, the first lady. And I found out that Dr. Brown had had several strokes, and he was now living in a nursing home in some other state. And I actually got to talk to the daughter who has a catnip farm, makes catnip toys right there near that town, near or in that town. So I got to talk to three different people that were very closely associated with him. Couldn't get anybody to give me the number of the nursing home, but through talking to, I can't remember, one or the other of them said the name of the nursing home. So then again, Bob got on Internet, got the phone number of the nursing home. I called. I didn't really have any hope of talking to no, him. No, because didn't somebody the say, don't bother said, to talk yeah, to him? Yeah, the daughter said he, you wouldn't be able to talk to him. He's not feeling well, and you just, you're not going to be able to talk to him. But I just thought, oh, I could just say I love the books. I just wanted him to hear that. So... Before we get into that, we're right at the midpoint of the show, so we're going to take a break, and then we're going to get right back to hearing about, did Linda get through to Dr. Brown or not? We'll find out, because uh, if you had read these books, he's definitely somebody you would want to talk to, because these are just wonderful, wonderful Wonderful veterinary stories. stories. Harrowing stories, hilarious, just full of mishaps. So you're listening to What Were You Thinking? I'm uh, Bob Tart, author of Enslaved by Ducks, Fall Weather, and the forthcoming Funnel of Happiness, and I'm here with Linda, and we'll be back right after this break. What Were You Thinking? We'll be right back after Bob gets the ducks out of his living room. Don't go away. The 
is a movement afoot, ShoeBuy.com. Join the millions of people who shop ShoeBuy.com's over 400 brands and 500,000 products. Order now and get free shipping and free return shipping. ShoeBuy.com, the world's greatest shoe store. Walk your dog in style and comfort. Enter the code THINKING, T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G, at checkout and get a 10% discount plus free shipping at ShoeBuy.com. Love your pets but wish their medications were a lot less expensive? They are at 1-800-PET-MEDS. You'll not only save on flea and heartworm medications, but on prescriptions for arthritis, incontinence, thyroid, and more. And you get fast service, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Plus, our licensed pharmacists ensure accuracy, monitor drug interaction, and more. See why over 5 million people have trusted their pet's health to 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Call now or order online. Go to PetMeds.com forward slash what, W-H-A-T, to get 10% off any order and free shipping on orders of $39 or more. At Petco, we really love pets. There isn't anything we won't do to make sure they're getting the best products and the best care. So when you ask us a question like, So how do you feel about cat condos? We can say from experience, Feels like home. For her. Enter the code WHAT, W-H-A-T, and save 10% on orders of $65 or more, plus free shipping at Petco.com. FTD's network of over 40,000 florists around the world have been creating beautiful handcrafted arrangements for 100 years. Each arrangement is delivered the same day and backed by FTD's seven-day satisfaction guarantee. For a century, people have trusted their most important occasions to the flower experts at FTD. Since Pet Life Radio is all about puppy dogs and flowers, our listeners, that's you, can get a 20% discount on your order. Just go to florop.com and use the code THINKING at checkout. F-L-E-U-R-O-P dot com and use the code word T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G. Would you like your business to reach out and invite in our audience? We have a brand new trademark concept called Info Seeds. Info Seeds are short 20 second seeds of information about your place of business, practice, or service. Is the best, most cost effective way to invite us in. We only have a limited number of slots left. For more information, visit the website PetLifeRadio.com. Click on sponsorship information. There you can listen to a sample of Info Seed. Remember, only a limited number of opportunities this year, Americans are expected to spend a jaw-dropping $36 billion on their pets. From lighted leashes to high-end spa products, the discriminating pet owner can find just about anything to pamper his or her pet. Hi, this is Michelle Fern. Join me every week for Best Bets for Pets, where we'll talk about the latest pet products and talk to the companies that make them. Best Bets for Pets, every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, ducks are in the pond, rabbits in his hutch, and monkeys... Ow! In my car! Oh, okay, well, I go check my insurance policy. We'll turn you back over to Bob. Hi, we're back with the second half of What Were You Thinking? Bob Tart and Linda Tart. So, you called the nursing home wondering if you were going to be able to get a hold of him. talk to him. And the lady at the receptionist desk said, I will connect you with his nurse. So, I, even then, I thought, eh, they're not going to let me talk to him. But, as luck would have it, or good luck would have it, the nurse said, oh, he just woke up from a nap. I'll see if he wants to talk. So, next thing I knew, there was, there was this uh, vet on the phone with me, very elderly man. They act like he wasn't going to be able to talk to me, but he did. He was frail. You could tell he was frail. But he seemed alert enough, and I told him that I thought it was the best book of that type I'd ever read. 
it's very similar to James Harriet's stories, except that his were more courageous, more daring do, and so much bravery. And I said, I never read any books I like better than those. And I asked him some things about things I read in the book. I said, when you were in that plane that was headed right for the ground, I said, you know, the Lord must have really been with you. I mean, you met by about 300 feet of doing a nose drive right into the ground. Yeah, he was also a pilot, and he had to sometimes He'd go, to go on islands. vet calls to islands yeah, off nearby. the coast of Maine. Right, and he had his own little plane. And he um, got in a mix-up there, and that plane is within about 300 feet of hitting the ground in a nosedive. It went into a, some kind of spin, and there, there he was. For some reason, right at the last uh, few seconds, the, it came out of its spin, and he was all right. And I said, the Lord was really with you, and he said, yes, he was. So I, I, was, I was happy to hear him say that. And uh, he just had so many exciting and things that could have killed anybody else, and somehow he made it through it. Very exciting. Bulls chasing him, horses leaning up against him, and, and just you, you just can't imagine the things that happened to this guy. Yeah, I talked to him and, a few uh, minutes too, and he sounded good. He sounded fine. He didn't, he was just, he sounded fine. A frail and weak, but I was very, very happy yeah, that I'm I caught fra- him right at the right time. I'm frail and weak too. <laughs> And uh, I just considered myself very privileged to be able to talk to this man, and I I hope it made him feel good knowing that somebody really cared and loved uh, those books so much. Yeah, now we had talked to, I think it was Linda had spoken to the daughter, and I think she said she had hoped to come out with a third book of his exploits. The other two books are about large animal veterinary, and was it the daughter or was it the father? The editor editor said, no, I didn't think so, because the third book would have been about anecdotes about when he went to small animal practice, when he got too, um, you know, he wasn't feeling well enough to do the large, strong enough to do the large animal practice anymore. But he said he didn't think that those stories were acceptable to make another book out of, that there was too much anecdotal stuff that wasn't necessarily he didn't think as it was. It was. Well, what's, what I think is interesting, too, is that the um, two books apparently had different editors, and it shows you what a difference an editor the daughter, can make. One of the daughters edited the first book. The one called a While You're Here, Doc. style of writing. I didn't notice it so much, but Bob did the second one. I had a different style of writing. Yeah, the first book, so. they're more elaborate descriptions, and mm-hmm. to me, they're more short story-like. Mm-hmm. The second book... Just like he would have said it. Yeah, the second book, the editor said he wanted it just like the doctor would have sat and told the story, so they're not embellished at all, and right. they're still really good. They're really fun, very straightforward, but I think I like the first approach a little better because right. I, I like the kind of story approach. I asked that editor how he did that, and he um, talked into a microphone, into a tape recorder, and then the guy would write the stuff down and, of course, you know, change it a little bit, but make it more or less like it was well, how he said it on the tape. Okay. Um, we got to pause a second because I thought we had full batteries, but I see they're running out. So uh, uh, hang on. We're going to pause a second. Well, that was amazing. You know, it said that the uh, little indicator said the batteries were either full or three quarters full, and in just a few minutes we were talking, they went down to zero. No, yep, that vacuum cleaner mine does the same thing. You va- are a little sharp. They're a little sharp. We won't talk anymore about that. We did a whole show. <laughs> we about got a the- basement full of sharks. Yeah, we did trials and tribulations of the uh, shark cordless sweeper. There's a whole show on that. So. Uh, mm-hmm. So anyway, and that's the story about uh, Dr. Bradford Brown. Yeah, is know, there anything else you want to say yeah, about the, that? Yeah, you know, like the moral of that story is, you know what? If you really like somebody's work and you want to tell them, go out of your way to try to find a, a way to call them or write them or something. Because people like to hear that. This guy's elderly. I bet that made his day hearing that. And where there's a will, there's a way. If you want to tell somebody something, tell them. Like me with the grocery store. If they got some product I can't stand, I am going to find a person to change it. And that's just the way it is. You do make a difference, you can make a difference, and you will make a difference by saying what you want to say. Of course, what usually happens at the grocery store is any product that we like... Will disappear off the shelf. It's just gone after... As if Linda and Bob like it, let's get rid of it. Yeah, I think they monitor uh, what I buy on my debit card, and uh, they have a special person they've hired just to look at the receipts. Oh, 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 here's something they like. We won't order it anymore. Can't be any good. Get rid of it. Yep. So... uh, I'm hoping that in a year or so from now, when I'm in a nursing home, ah! that uh, some of you folks will track me down and uh, let me know that you've uh, enjoyed my That's books. exactly right. Yeah. So what else did you want to talk about? Well, 
Oh. When spring comes, we got the, what are you looking at? Oh, the bowl thing. Yeah, you should talk about the, um. Well, I have a, yeah, the, um, I have a, I have a plant stand. Well, it, it, uh, it also has the big radio on it. So it's got a big, uh, we call a boom box on it and all my plants. Yeah, how about five plants? About, yeah, four, one, two, three, four, or five plants. They're not sitting here now. They're downstairs outside. We'll tell you why in a minute. Because of a certain event. Yeah, t- t- tell us what happened when you uh, came into the, um, Dining room one I was morning. In what the, did you find? I um, I just well, one evening I was standing by that little. Ta- I don't know what I was doing over there. Probably adjusting the covers on top of the cages, and I heard a little squeaky sound. It's the same room our birds are in. It was dark. It was after dark. All the birds were covered. It sounded like little baby mice squeaking. I thought, gosh, there's baby mice around here somewhere, somewhere on this table. Didn't really know where. Couldn't find them, but I did make a mental note of that. Couldn't find them. A few days later, I smell the mouse smell coming from the radio itself. It's a big boombox looking thing. I didn't dare like touch the radio, turn it upside down. I didn't want to know. But when the cleaning lady came, I said, smell that radio. Tell me what you think. (laughs) And she said, tip it up. See if you can see anything. She saw a big gaping hole in the back part. What it has is, to do with it's a port it's to a port amplify to the bass. Right. It's so it's just a the hole that go goes through. into the radio. Unfortunately, I think some little creature decided that'd be a good place to go live and or rest. So at any rate, the thing smells so bad, we had to get it out of the house. It just about knocked me. I put my nose too close <laughs> Even to Bob it and I could took smell a sniff it. and it just about knocked me out and the... The little creature not only apparently was going in and out of there and using it as his restroom, right. but it was also, uh, it found an old cassette tape and it shredded Unra- that. Using that for nesting material, mm-hmm. evidently. So who else? So but, you took it outside and tried to shake the, <laughs> yeah, tried to sh- <laughs> shake the mice out of it. I could not open the thing up because it's one of these modern products Molded that, uh, thing that's just you know, if you do succeed and get it open... All of the parts inside will leap out, and you'll never get them back in again. <laughs> so, uh, we, so it uh, got retired to the barn. Yeah, who else but us would have some kind of rodent invade our <laughs> boombox in the house? And but, all four of my plants, yes. the Moses and the Bulrushes, the Christmas Cactus, the Pencil Plant, and uh, what's that other thing? I don't remember. Um, I got one more plant. What's the other one? There's four of them. Is it the mother-in-law or the aloe? Aloe, my aloe plant. All four of them had these mouse dug holes in there, and they were throwing dirt all over the table. I would, cl- I cleaned it all up. Next morning, dirt all over the table. So I knew, oh, and what happened before that was I was watering one of them, and the mouse jumped out of there. He came running across my path. I jumped out of my skin just about. So I knew that all those plants had to go outside. We'd have to dump the dirt out and see where the mouse was. So the cleaning lady, Bob, and I dumped all the dirt, took them down the picnic table outside, dumped them. Of course, the mouse isn't in any of them. Yeah, one by one, we're taking these plants. I wrecked my plants. Shaking the plants' dirt out disturbing over. Disturbing the roots, making a big mess. Shaking it no out over mice. a trash bag. Shifting through the dirt to see if there's shifting mice in shifting. it. Sifting. Sifting yeah. and shifting. And then uh, putting, Nothing. filling the pots back up. Who else would that happen to? So we set a trap, a live trap. We don't like to kill them. So, you know, we take them three quarters of a mile up the street. So, set the trap. Nobody would go in it. They're too smart for that. But finally, I did catch what was... Bob thinks it's a shrew. Yeah, I, I thought it was a vole. But vole's it's kind got of, a pink nose. Voles look like hamsters. Looks like it's burrowing, and it's got this longer tail. It doesn't quite look like a mouse. I caught that, and I thought, that's it. We're all okay. We're all okay now. Can bring my plants back in. My poor plants had been languishing in the basement in the in dark. In the dark. Too. I felt so sorry for them. They were wilty looking and horrible. So I turned an artificial light on. I don't think it did any good. Anyway, moved them all back upstairs. Life is good now again. No more problems. No such luck. Within a few days, dirt was all over that table again. So evidently there's two of them. Yeah, and right? so I guess if it's a shrew, it kind of makes sense because um, they dig the in the... Yeah, Mrs. Shrew was digging in our plants trying to find something to eat. Because outside, I, unlike mice that probably will eat anything, I think shrews probably mostly like grubs. Yeah, they're probably eating the roots on my plants. I think they're probably looking for bugs, though, and they were disgusted. because no they, dirt in the house. They're not happy it. in the house. We'd be glad to escort them outside. Right. Well, at least they're, they're only in, in this there. room. There's no dirt. Oh, that's right. They could get in the living room. Yeah, well, anyway, that's what they don't there. get in there. Yeah. So uh, leave it to us to have in the house to have a shrew invade our boombox 
and then wreck my plants and then invade the plants and don't you, even know how to get rid of the thing we need to kill meanwhile them. we have five cats in the house and we, yeah are the cats doing any kind of laying rodent around, control no laying around making friends with them or something right right so, so anyway that's our life with mice and rodents <laughs> Now, do you want to talk about the wood ducks a little so bit? So we, um, every year, every spring, well, you know, the, it floods. we got the river behind our house, but there's a tributary that leads water into the area directly down the hill. It makes a great big, huge pond. So every spring, the wood ducks come to swim in that pond. Yeah, we're about we 500 to... feet from the river, and there's a low area mm. down the hill behind the house. And every spring, that fills up we, and it yeah. turns into a pond. We started getting, one year, we started getting a couple wood ducks. Swimming around in there, and then it was two, and then it was four, and then it was six, and then it was eight. Anyway, we started putting food up in the hill in piles so they'd come, be lured up. We want to see them closer, so that's what happened. So every year now, we get six to ten or more wood ducks that waddle up the hill every, was it, morning and evening, different times of the day. But especially, it's quite convenient because at dinner time, there they are eating at the same time we're eating, and they kind of fight with each other and chase each other. And they look like little um, cartoon ducks. They have real short, stubby legs, and they kind of waddle from side to side and do this little fighting thing. They They're really, really chase each other, innocuous looking, but it's funny to watch them chase each other. Yeah, and these are ducks that are normally pretty shy. And I remember how this started was um, years ago, we put food out for a couple wild mallards that were coming into the yard that wanted some food. So we put some scratch feed behind the fence for the wild mallards. And yep. then before we knew it, these incredibly shy wood ducks started coming out of the water and walking up the hill. Yep. And now they've gotten to the point, this spring it started again, where if they just saw us at the windows, they'd fly off. But yep. they're getting braver now. By the end of the time, before they go away, they just are not as scared of us. Yep. So our yeah. record so far this That's year 10. is 10. We had uh, five females and five males. And it's fun when we're eating dinner, we can just... Look out the window yeah, there and there they are. are wood ducks. They eat, eat at eat. the same time. We, oh, they're eating dinner. Guess I'll eat dinner too. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they haven't knocked on the door and said, well, what are you guys well, having? Uh, any treats? Yeah. So, so it's uh, something we look forward to every year. They're just a very, if you've never seen a wood duck, look it up on your internet or something. They're a beautiful little duck. Absolutely darling. Tiny. Really, really cute. Yeah, they're ducks. really scrappy because they really chase each oh, other. Oh, yeah. Tough guy. You got like seven piles down there, but they fight over every single plant. Me and my wife are eating at this pile. You're not eating here. So so we're having a real nice warm day. And so uh, in just a couple minutes when we finish this podcast, because we're just about out of time. The woodchucks. We got the woodchucks. Oh, that's right. The woodchucks are on the hill, and they're eating, too. And this is the time of year we also get, they come right up the top by the fence. They got a face like a little bear, and they sit and chomp the food and stare up at us. Sometimes the they're so lazy, they lie on their bellies while they eat. With their back legs stretched, stretched out, like you'd see a dog do that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's seen the rabbits do that. Yeah, so that's amazing. So we think we have maybe two, maybe we'll have babies again. Last year, we never got to see the babies when they were tiny, but we have a brush pile out in the field. Last year, oh, when the babies were half grown, suddenly there was these tinier versions of the big fat woodchucks up the top of the hill eating with the mother and or father. So I saw two of them running back and forth on top of the brush pile. So I'm thinking maybe we'll get babies again this year. I'm really going to like that. It could be. We'll I love see. them. See, I got fences around my garden with even top, uh, netting tops on them, or they will be as soon as Charlie puts them on there. So I don't worry about my gardens getting eaten by them. So I, we really like the woodchucks. Yep. No problem. Yep. They make a whistly sound when you approach. They have this sort of fear thing they do with a high-pitched whistle. Yeah, I think down south they call them the whistle pig. Yeah. Whistle pig. It's really neat to hear. Yep. So that's it. That's We're out of time for this week, and we're about to go to a place called McPherson uh, Fallsburg Park and go birding and see if we'll see anything, and we probably won't. We might. We might. So thanks for listening. Happy uh, spring. Happy spring. Thanks to our producer, our long-suffering producer, Mark Winter. And uh, thanks to all our friends out there. Thanks and for uh, drop us a line at bob at petliferadio.com. And please check out my website, bobtart.com, T A R T E, bobtart.com. And you'll find information on my books, Enslaved by Ducks and Fall Weather. And if you're on Facebook, uh, look me up on Facebook, Bob Tart, and uh, send me a friend request. And like. we'd love to hear your pet stories. Yes, we would. So bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thinking about buying a monkey? How about a ferret or a skunk? Then check out the show that will answer the burning questions, where do you get them? What do you feed them? How do you take care of them? And most of all, what were you thinking? 
with exotic pet expert and author Bob Tart. Every week on demand from PetLifeRadio.com.